Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Buenos dias. My name is Louis Yakumi, and I'm the publisher of the Automotive Logistics Group. And on behalf of Automotive Logistics and AIAG, the Automotive Industry Action Group, I'd like to welcome you to the first Automotive Logistics Mexico Conference. We're very honored uh, to have participation from some fantastic people that highlights the importance of the automotive and logistics industries to, uh, to Mexico. Among our special guests include uh, the Secretary of the Economy, the Fondo Nacional de Infraestructura, the, the US Ambassador, the Governors of Guanajuato and La Scala, the Presidents of Ford, Mexico and Delphi, Mexico. And of course, every speaker, every panel member, every attendee, you all have a very important role to play at this conference, to make this conference beneficial for your industry. And more importantly, I hope the information that you collect from this, from this conference, the contacts that you make, the conversations that you have, will be very, very beneficial to Mexico's role in the global automotive industry. Amongst the other thank yous I need to make are, of course, our sponsors, our global sponsor, Willanius Wilhelmsen Logistics, our gold sponsors, APL Vascor, ProTrans, Ryder, XPO Logistics, and our silver sponsors, Air Charter Service, Geodis Wilson, Goodpack, Jack Cooper, KHS, Orbis, Seglo Logistics, and UTI. And I'd also like to expend a, extend a special thank you to the US-Mexico Chamber of Commerce for the support that they also gave us to, to put this, this program together. But we've got a fantastic first session to begin the conference. So I'll keep my, my involvement initially to, uh, to very short. The first session will include uh, Ildefonso Guajardo, the Secretary of the Economy from the Government of Mexico, Gabriel Lopez, President and CEO of Ford Mexico, Hector Gutierrez, the President of Delphi Mexico. But uh, we're particularly honored to have as the opening speaker uh, for the conference uh, to make a special keynote presentation. And after his presentation, we'll have special uh, questions, a Q&A session directly with, with the minister. And then, and then we'll go on to the, uh, the rest of the session. So I'm uh, honored and delighted to welcome uh, the first speaker of the day at the very first Automotive Logistics Conference, Mr. Defonso Guajardo, the Secretary of the Economy for the Med Federal Government of Mexico. Secretary. Before uh, deciding in which language I will talk, I need to do a search. Can you raise your hand if you speak only English? Can you raise your hand if you speak only Spanish? Si solo hablan español y no inglés. Can you raise your hand if you are bilingual? Well, that, that gets it. I mean, it's, that makes the decision. <laughs> so the only, the only problem is that you are going to suffer through a very rough English that was learned in Mexican public schools. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, I'll try my best. When I was invited for this panel, and let me tell you the truth, there is a very good friend of mine that I met too many years ago when we were doing NAFTA in Washington. It was 1991, Al Zapanta, that uh, last year he was trying to invite me to different uh, gatherings in the U.S. And for one reason or another, I had trips with the president and I had to cancel him. So when he invited me to be here with you today, I definitely could not afford to say no. And I had in my schedule this meeting for a long time. And when it came to be on a sector that is of a fundamental importance for the Mexican economy, definitely was a must. So Luis, thank you for putting this together. It's a great opportunity for Mexico to be hosting this type of events. 
I also would like to express my gratitude to Gabriel Lopez, a, a very good friend of Mexico and somebody that has been committed to bringing the most of the projects he can to the Mexican economy. And thanks to Hector Gutierrez, who represents one of the greatest uh, auto part industries in the, in the country. It, they suggested for me to, to focus on this panel or in this uh, intervention on three points. Why Mexico? How are we looking into the prospectives for sales and production? And what will be the future for the Mexican car industry? My staff had prepared some remarks in Spanish, so I'll be trying just to use them as reference when I'm talking about the statistics. Let's, let's first review the magnitude and the relevance of what the car industry is today. We have 10 firms in the auto industry, what we call light vehicles, and 11 that produce heavy trucks. The ratio of this industry in our GDP is about 17% of our manufacturing GDP. And it represents one fifth, one of every five employments that the manufacturing sector of Mexico is delivering today. And when you look at exports, the auto industry counts for one third of Mexican, almost one third of Mexican exports around the world. So by the shared size and relevance, you realize that you are facing one of the most dynamic and challenging industries in this country. Now, when you look in retrospective, and when you try to go back in history, how did all start it? You have to back, go back around the end of the 60s. A bright Mexican at that point came out with something that was called el decreto automotriz mexicano. And at the beginning, el decreto, what a set of rules that will allow Mexican companies to assemble vehicles with some requirements that at least certain minimum, minimal parts should have been produced in Mexico. All, it's obvious that 35 years ago, or 40 years ago, the Mexican content was practically non-existent. Through time, aligned with good policies, this has developed to an industry that has been very well integrated to the point where some of the big companies had been developing engineering centers, design centers, where Mexican engineers are contributing to the design and value added in the auto industry in North America. But this happened not just by magic. It happens because there was a transformation in the way Mexico was doing things. When the auto decree started, Mexico was a close economy. GATT did not exist, what is called today the World Trade Organization. And back in the 80s, 86, we made a very specific effort to join the World Trade Organization that was called GATT. And there, a process of opening the Mexican economy started and reached the highest point when we joined NAFTA, the North American Trade Agreement. When those talks started back in the 90s, very few individuals believed that a set of three countries with different levels of development will be able to really join forces to create one of the biggest trading zones in the world with the kind of rules that a free trade agreement will imply. Finally, unfortunately, it did happen. And it did happen because of the commitment of the leadership involved. In the US, NAFTA was possible thanks that you had a visionary president, George Bush Sr., that really bought the idea to impulse this concept. But at the same time, President Bush lost the election and a Democratic president came to office and NAFTA was not done. Well, it did require the political sk skills of Bill Clinton to really make it pass the US Congress. Without the vision of a Republican president and the political skills of a Democratic president, 
NAFTA would not have been a reality today. So the first lesson we learn in public policy is that it does require temper, courage, but also the willing to make decisions not for the next election, but for the next generation in order to really grasp what is best for society. Because if at the end of the day, you just listen today of what the electorate is telling you, sometimes this electorate is afraid of what is going on in the world economy, and probably their first reaction is to go protectionist. But if you are a leader, you know that free trade, at the end of the day, pays back. And specifically, this industry is telling you about the tremendous payback that the auto industry has been giving to North America, and specifically to the way we do things between US, Mexico, and Canada. At the beginning, when we were crafting NAFTA, we thought we were just creating a free trade zone. Today, we know that we just not created a, a way to trade things. We created an area where we can put things together efficiently and effectively. Let me keep on sharing some of the numbers. In the two first years of President Peña administration, we got either groundbreakings in our roles or announce, announcements of investment for almost $20 billion in the auto industry, which will create at least 50,000 jobs in the, between 2013 and 2018. So this is the speed at which things are happening today in Mexico. I don't know if it's proper to mention specific names. I, know, I don't know if all the players are here. <clears throat> but just to make you a very brief set of the big announcements we got last year. Just recently, General Motors announced a $5 million investment. BMW, for the first time, is coming to Mexico to produce the high-end luxury vehicles with an investment of $1 billion in San Luis Potosí. Nissan Dalmer Mercedes announced a joint venture for more than $1.2 billion in Aguascalientes to produce the Infinity and another uh, vehicle from Mercedes. Audi already is well under construction and ready to start production in San Jose, Chiapa, Puebla, with an investment of $1.3 billion. Mazda came in with uh, almost $800 million in Salamanca. Honda also with a similar investment in Celaya, Guanajuato. And the list is going, going on, on, and on. Probably we will have a couple of more announcements that will make us very happy with uh, probably a US company that is very close to make a good announcement. And probably a Japanese company that is almost getting close to finalize a deal. And the latest, Mexico did not have a Korean industry. And Kia announced just recently that it's coming to my home state of Nuevo León with an investment of $1 million to create 3,000 jobs and bringing with them at least 11 companies for auto parts that will create another 3,000 jobs in this region. Now, what were the numbers for 2014? All of them record-breaking. For the first time, our production went above 3 million cars, 3,220,000 cars for year 2014. It, it is a record. It, it is 10% higher than what we, what we produced in 2013. At the same time, we became the seventh largest producer in the world, moving up from the eighth number to the seventh number. We kept our place as the fourth largest exporters in the world, number first in Latin America. And for the first time, we sold in the domestic market more than 1 million cars, 1,135,000 cars. This figure is putting us close to the last record in 2006, that was 1,139,000. Obviously, the domestic market is the chip on the shoulder on the car industry. The high success is the export market. I will explain what is, what is going on in the domestic market, and what are we doing to really advance the, dom the domestic market. Exports last year exceeded the 2,600,000 units, 
increasing almost also 10% from what we exported in 2013. The question is, where are our cars going? 70% the US, about 10% Canada, about 4% Brazil. They also are going to Asia. Now, our fastest growing markets are the Asian markets and Canada. Unfortunately, a very hard, very strong growing market, South America, had slowed down because of a sudden change in trade agreements between Argentina, Brazil, and Mexico. From free trade, they went back to quantity restrictions, but our last agreement commit us to have free trade again by March 19 of this year. We are starting discussions on that front. Now, part of the success <coughs> of these uh, uh, dynamics of the industry, as I was sharing with you, was the explicit decision of opening the Mexican economy. So we subscribed NAFTA, and from there on, Mexico has been a couple of times in transition in the executive branch at the presidential level. Once in the year 2000, year 2006, and then year 2012. And the good news is that all governments, regardless of political parties, had supported strongly a policy of free market, open economy, which has given us credibility for all the industries that see Mexico as an excellent platform for reaching other markets in the world. Today, after 20 years of enjoying NAFTA, we have 10 agreements with 45 countries around the world that give us access to, one, to more than 1 billion consumers in the world. In that context, when we analyze rationally our foreign trade policy, once realized that everything has been managed quite properly. We are trying to improve the relationship with North America, not with the NAFTA 2.0, as sometimes it's been discussed. The, it is very simple. If we are producing things together, how can we improve the way we do things together? Reducing transaction costs, improving border crossings, improving how customs <coughs> work on the border, improving harmonization of rules and standards. It is to completely illogic asking different requirements for an industry that is working together. So the agenda with President Obama and my colleague Penny Prisker has been concentrated heavily on how can we make life easier for the guys that are producing things together. Because today, as you know, sometimes a part of a car can go across the border almost seven times in order to finally be placed in a unit. So the more costly we make it for you to go across the borders, the more ineffective we do the process of production, and the less competitive the North American continent becomes. So in that regard to the North is how we reduce transaction costs in our agreements. How we do we improve <coughs> innovation? How do we go to the frontier of how we compete with other regions in the world? And within that context, there has been something amazing happening in the last 10 years in North America that is just starting to happen in Mexico, energy. In the energy front, it's changing basically the game. Why? Because just like we have a demographic bonus in Mexico, where more than 50% of the population is younger than 60 years, years of age, which gives us a tremendous potential for labor force and trained labor force, the same happened with energy. We have an energy bo bonus in North America with gas shale at 2.9 per uh, million BTUs, is one third of, or, or one fifth of what they are paying in Asia or what they are paying in Europe. That will reduce the cost of electricity. As a matter of fact, starting in January, the cost of electricity for, for industries in Mexico has been reduced by 16% because we are getting away from diesel and combustolius to use gas that is less, less contaminant and is less expensive in the production of electricity. And that will help, obviously, the cost of production in the manufacturing industry, including auto parts and autos. 
Now, within this uh, context, when you look at how we are uh, uh, advancing, how we connect to the world, we just sign an agreement called Alianza Pacifico. Alianza Pacifico puts together Peru, Chile, Colombia, and Mexico. Those four countries are responsible for getting 42% of the foreign investment that comes to Latin America. Those four countries represent half of the foreign trade that Latin America does with the rest of the world. Those four countries have very similar commitments in terms of free markets, and a friendly environment for investment, good rule of law, and definitely is a fresh of bread air for investors thinking about Latin America. This has been a successful process. We are about to pass our agreement to our legislative branches in these four countries, and we are ready to expand Alianza Pacifico to include partners from Asia, from the rest of Latin America, to really make it effective and growing. And definitely, when you look at the numbers, you may think that those countries are small, but our fastest growth of rate in exports for textiles, for uh, heavy trucks, is going to that market, to Colombia, to Chile, to Peru, because those are countries that have been growing on average about 5% in the last few years. Now, going across the ocean to the east, we had an agreement with Europe since year 2000. That agreement is getting old, just like NAFTA is getting a, a bit old, and we are in the process of modernizing the Mexico Economic Union Agreement. Canada has just finished an agreement with the European Union, and the US is just negotiate, negotiating an agreement. Originally, when I talked to Mickey Cantor, USTR, I had requested him before we came into government, that they may consider that the negotiation with Europe should be North America with the European Union. Since the three of us, at the end of the day, are going to have bilaterals with Europe, it will make the most of sense in the world to do a regional to regional agreement. I believe that uh, the White House was not ready due to the complexity of the negotiation with Europe. And they told us that at this point, they will go for the bilateral, and maybe at the end, we will think in convergence of the three bilaterals into one regional. The, from the point of view of economics, does not make any sense. From the point of view of politics, it gives a lot of restrictions. And, Ka and, Mi and uh, Mike Froman was right, because Europe was not ready to do that because Turkey was asking Europe to join the negotiation. And if the U.S. opened the negotiation for Mexico, the Europeans will feel very strongly forced to open the negotiation for Turkey. And that was a highly political risk to take at this point in Europe. So at the end of the day, they went for the bilateral, but we have a consulting group advising the kind of actions in that agreement that will hurt the ability of North America to be effective in production value change in this process. Because at the end of the day, a lot of U European companies are also invested in Mexico. And if the rule of origin agreement between the US and Europe is highly restrictive, it will be a shoot on the foot for many American and European companies that are already placed in Mexico. It will make no sense that the restrictions of that agreement will be a block for us to keep on building our productive capacities uh, together. So at the end of the, of the day, I will say that uh, we will be, with Europe, working very fast starting in March, modernizing our, our agreement. It's too limited and will be eventually done by year 2016 to complete this agreement that is a, a strong requirement to really advance our relationship with Europe. Now, here you have North, South, East. And the question, what has been happening with the Mexican policy, trade policy with Asia? Well, I think through too many years, we were completely disregarding the relevance and the importance of Asia. The only thing that we did in these 20 years in trade agreements was with an Asian country was one, Japan. 
And thanks God we did it, because thanks to that, the Japanese investment in Mexico has been growing quite fast. But even the agreement with Japan is, is quite limited, and we are working in a way to expand that, either bilaterally or through TPP, which is a negotiation that is trying to change the way Mexico is doing business with Asia. Because we cannot disregard the relevance of a continent that has been growing in the past on rates very close between 6 and 10 percent. So we cannot have the luxury of not understanding the dynamics of the world when you saw the growth rates in the last five years of Asia, and Mexico cannot be left out of that equation. Our way to come back into the dynamics of Asia are two ways. One, join TPP, which we are about to close no later than the first six months of this year. That will give us access to South Pacific and Asian markets that we don't have uh, commercial activities or strong commercial activities with them. Through TPP, we will modernize NAFTA. But at the same time, there will be also a radical change and has been a radical change in the way we associate with China. It is, we had a terrible policy in the way Mexico associated with China. Just look at what happened in the commercial relationship between the US. China became basically the second largest player in the US economy. They displaced Mexico in many areas of exports to the US. So with the force of that size, you cannot have the luxury of not designing public policy on how you relate to China. So President Peña made the first visit of China in April of 2013 to a Bobao meeting, and from there, a very strong relationship has developed. Just give you a quick reference of what China means in terms of trade relationships. We buy from China $57 billion of merchandise. It's the second largest trading partner from Mexico. We sell to China $7 billion. Our trade deficit is $50 billion. And traditionally, the relations with China were characterized by conflict. The, the textile guys were always fighting because China was selling on their cost, the steel guys. So, but when you analyze the, 50, the $57 billion that they sell us, only 8% were final goods. Shoes, textiles. So we were making a big issue and fighting for 8% of the trade. When you analyze 92% of the trade, those are intermediate goods that join the production change to make our exports more competitive globally. Obviously, we don't like that very much, but that's the reality. Our challenge is how we substitute our own inputs made in Mexico to little by little replace imports from Asia and give more value added to Mexican production. But in the meanwhile, the 35% of value added in one industry of Mexican goods will not be able to go and be competitive if we not bring in inputs from the US and inputs from China. Every dollar that we export has 38 cents of US content, just to give you an idea of how interlinked the US and the Mexican economy are. But just as the US recognizes that trade with China is required for global trade, we all have to require that the name of the game in trade is no longer exports are good, imports are bad. Today, the game is not in final goods. It's in how much you introduce in the value global change and how able you are to make uh, your uh, human resources effective and creative to really give a big push in this, in this regard. Now, looking ahead, what is in front of us and who we want, what we want to really develop? There are some estimates that are quite interesting, uh, either for 2015, uh, from AMIA, from the Mexican uh, automotive industry, which they say that for this year, they hope to reach the 3.5 be a million uh, level of production in Mexico to export almost 3 million cars this year and to really break our record of 2006 of internal sales by 1 million point two uh, thousand units. 
Now, the outlook for a, for, for a longer view in 2020, some people are saying that we will be able to produce 5 million vehicles and that we will be moving in this scale from producer number seven to producer number five. I do believe that just by looking at the level of uh, intention of companies coming to invest in Mexico. But the big challenge has to do with what is the percentage of Mexican content in the car industry. And that's what is very important, uh, your presence here, for the ones that are already here to assure you that the future looks bright, and for the ones that have not invested to encourage you to find your prop, if you need a, a partner or to make a decision, will be in the best disposition to help you find a, a, the best possible deal and location for your investment. What are we doing different in the internal market that we had not done in the past? First of all, we had a tremendous problem with the intervention in Mexico of used cars from the US. Unfortunately, these cars, used cars, were not meeting environmental standards of technical standards. Those were cars older than 10 years that came basically to pollute the Mexican environment and really we call chatarrizar uh, uh, over, over streets. Now, that ha was happening because although NAFTA provided for a free flow of used cars with some limits for age, there was uh, something called in Spanish a legal action called Amparo that was badly handled by the judiciary and gave an open hand to importers to just bring cars without not committing or complying with any regulation. So all of the sudden, the importation of used cars became a huge problem. We introduced several measures this year. So far, we have reduced by 30% the level of cars that were coming to Mexico from last year. And not just that, we, ch we, we maintain the auto decree for uh, importation of used cars in a way to make it basically inviolable, uh, in very strong against any suits. And therefore, uh, the, the, the outlook is that we will keep this going and reducing the amount of not good cars coming to Mexico. That was one problem of the industry that we are taking care of. The second one was financing. The financing sector was do not doing a good job in trying to facilitate credit for the purchase of new cars. When you compare the ratio of new cars being financed in Brazil or Chile or the US, Mexico had been behaving on a, like about 50% were financed. This year, 2014, last year, we finally went back to the highest record in history, above 60% of financing, and we are moving strongly above. The Ministry of Economy has a program where we are giving guarantee money to the National Development Bank in order to multiply credits for financing in the car industry. This year, we're closing around uh, $3,000 million of financing produced with our uh, uh, effort in order to provide guarantees and facilitate this type of, of credit. When you talk about strengthening the value chain of the industry and really making sure that we can provide with more ideas, more technology, and more innovation, we have been working strategically with uh, very strong suppliers of the auto market with the steel makers, we are working with the glass producers, uh, we are very strongly encouraging uh, foreign investment in, in production of tires in Mexico. And so we are visualizing with a new program that we have set forth, which is called ProAuto, the way we can look at the market of more than $3 billion of inputs that are coming from abroad, that we already have the capabilities of, of really establishing medium-sized business to be suppliers of the car industry. And I will just end my comment with a very, very clear anal uh, analysis of why we are exactly at the verge of becoming highly competitive on some of those auto parts. The, the change in the energy industry, and specifically in the oil industry, is going to have a tremendous impact in the way we build things in Mexico. Just one element of this reform. Petrochemicals 
had been a stagnant industry due to the restrictions of the oil industry. In the last 30 years, we have been importing one, six, one, seven, 60 percent of what we needed of petrochemicals. With the new prices of gas and the new liberalization of the sector, we are becoming extremely competitive in the first part of the value change in the area of plastics, in, in, the, in, in many areas where petrochemicals are essential. And some of those areas are deeply related to auto parts that come from, the, from, from plastics. Uh, it's going to revolutionize textiles that somehow also are related to the interior of a car. So if you look at all the production process that are going to be affected by a lower cost, not only of electricity, but also of inputs, then you, you are going to have another area of competitive advantage to do what it takes in this context. At the end, I will just assure you that the other part that will always worry an investor is the stability of the financial markets and the stability of the economy. For the last 20 years, Mexico has been managing very responsible finances, strongly giving autonomy to the central bank with a very responsible monetary policy, but at the same time with very logical discipline in public finances. The question that is in your mind today is, and so how Mexico is going to face what is coming in terms of the price of oil? In 2016, fortunately, the Minister of Finance had bought protection in, in future markets for the prices of oil. So our budget was constructed on a barrel that has been guaranteed at $79 per barrel, which will reduce the impact on 2015 budget. But there's no question that 2016 cannot be protected. And one third of our in income in the public uh, sector comes from oil. Therefore, there will be an adjustment for 2016. The president has been extremely outspoken saying the only thing we will not risk is the credibility of the Mexican economy that if there is going to be less income, no question, we have to adjust expenditure. We cannot lose what we have been building through many years, confidence and trust on the Mexican economy. Thank you for being here this morning and thank you for your invitation. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Secretary, a fantastic opening and very positive uh, presentation on uh, the Mexican economy, uh, how important the automotive industry uh, is and the investments and the benefits of, of Mexico uh, for the global automotive industry. So now it's, uh, we'll take some questions uh, specifically for the, for the Secretary now. So uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand wait for the microphone to come to you to make sure we can hear you clearly and uh, and then uh, you state your name and uh, and the company you are representing and you can ask the question in English or Spanish whichever uh, whichever you prefer so uh, because we haven't got so much time I'll throw it out immediately to you if there is anyone who has uh, a question to begin with I, I have some questions here but it's it's only fair to give you the the opportunity uh, if you want to ask a question. Okay, well, I'll ask the first question. Um, it's, uh, it's, we, we talked a lot, uh, Mr. Secretary, about the, the importance of the automotive industry and also uh, the, the potential growth globally, inbound, uh, the parts uh, coming in and also outbound and the vehicles and the parts that are being manufactured within uh, Mexico being exported to Asia, to China, to ho Europe hopefully soon. North America is already strong, uh, but what makes all of this possible is good logistics and a good logistics infrastructure. So we heard about how important automotive is, but how important is developing the logistics uh, infrastructure and industry uh, to, from, and in, in Mexico? Eh, 
there, there was a presentation by President Peña last year about the Mexican infrastructure plan. And one of the things that uh, <coughs> is clear is that for too many years, most of the public projects in, in infrastructure were designed in isolation of a, <coughs> of a very clear planning for logistics, for moving people in different uh, types of transportation. So to give you an idea, uh, there is a beautiful road built between Mazatlán and Durango that costed uh, millions of dollars. But then it connects Durango with the Port of Mazatlán. And the Port of Mazatlán was left of the same site that has been for the last 30 years. So what, what sense does it make to invest that money in a huge, beautiful road if you don't open at the same time the size of the port? So this new plan is contemplated in an integral way that if you are going to open a, a way for, for logistics, you have to think in an integrated way, this, the new facilities for the ports, the new highways that are going to connect. Even uh, within this project is the new airport of Mexico City that is responsible for most of the cargo uh, coming from Mexico to Asia and other nations. And it will improve radically the way merchandise moves through air in highly valuable commodities or uh, products that travel uh, in a different way. Now, this is also being combined with uh, this intergovernmental group between the U.S. and Mexico, where for the first time we are trying to plan our logistics that connects on the borders. Because it happens very often that we'll be working towards a facility on one side of the border, but the U.S. will work on another side and they will never join. So the lack of planning between the two nations in, 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 in cargo transportation is essential. So this new infrastructure plan contemplates new investment in port facilities. Lazaro Cárdenas is expanding. Veracruz is going to go for a new terminal. We are going to do a, a very important investment in Salina Cruz, in Puerto Chiapas, in this new plan for the development of the south. And, and so uh, there is a lot of money uh, committed to infrastructure investment for the next uh, four years of this uh, administration. Now, I have to be honest, 2016 is going to be a tough year if the price of oil levels at around uh, is $55, $60, and that will have definitely an impact. The president is going to do his best effort that any shortening or reduction of expenditure will fall on current expenditure. and He will try to impact the least possible uh, capital investment infrastructure investment. But, uh, but the plans as they st stand today, they are very ambitious plan in terms, because we are very aware that one of the things that we have become very attractive is that we are in the crossroads between Asia, Europe, North America, and South America. And logistics is one of the most important parts of the full game. I just came back from Davos. I had a meeting with the ministers of WTO, the World Trade Organization. And the trace facilitation agreement is already in implementation mode. And that will have a very important impact the way we do business around the world and the cost it represents in terms of the movement of your merchandises. Today, it is, it is about 10% of what it costs to move things. So if we make an impact on that, it will be better than reducing uh, tariffs in goods. And also, whilst everyone in the room would love to hear you say that the Mexican government is paying for all of the infrastructure investment. I assume there's going to be a lot of emphasis on public-private partnerships as well. So what message have you got for the people in the room who are looking to invest in Mexico? How can they work with the government? What does the government want from them? And what support will the government give them to be part of public-private investments? Well, if you're talking in terms of uh, investors in the infrastructure area, definitely I was a congressman in uh, uh, 2009 to 2012. And as president of the Economic Commission, I made the final approval for the public and private uh, partnership uh, law. And it's a very, very modern law that simplifies the way to do things in the field of uh, PP, PPP projects, in which gives you a lot of legal certainty of your involvement. Because in the 
old framework, it was a mess. For instance, if you were going to do the infrastructure, and then there was, from using this infrastructure, you will provide a service, you will have to go on two levels of bidding in order to guarantee that you will do the construction, and then you have to bid for the services of that uh, infrastructure. Today, it is just one package. The end game is bidding for the service. It is your problem how you develop the infrastructure. It just has to meet the requirements of the service you are going to provide. And that simplifies things at, at the extreme. And, and also, there are new ways in which the private sector can make proposals, and, and the government should consider them if they are really uh, productive and they will Im impact the common good of society. And, and, and they'll have to give you a response if that project is viable or not. And in these days of, uh, of pressure from incomes, from the price of oil, I would think that uh, when government finances become a bit not so potent for financing, a big chunk of what we have to do will be based on PPP projects in order to really do not stop what the country needs in terms of infrastructure and development. Thank you. So any questions from the, from the audience? I'll take one at the front here first, please. Please introduce yourself and the company name as well, please. Good morning, Stuart McGill of Ray Toyota. Uh, my question is about the workforce. And so Mexico's done a lot for its infrastructure and its free trade agreements. What is Mexico doing to uplift the skill set of the workforce? The, in a way, you, I, I did not go through, through the package of reforms that President Peña, because of, I needed to concentrate on the auto industry. But we just finished on August of last year a set of very important uh, historical reforms that had to do with uh, antitrust law, telecommunications, uh, the financial sector, uh, energy sector. Uh, one of them that is extremely important is the educational reform. Now, the educational reform was aimed at trying to improve the quality of education through the country and trying to bring the same level of opportunities everywhere. Just to share with you, there was a story not long ago that talked about the tales of two Mexicos. And that story is based on the fact that if you live in Monterrey, your productivity is 10, ten times higher than if you live in Oaxaca. And the same goes for many indicators in terms of coverage of education, quality of education. I always give the example of my own life experience. I'm the product of public education, and I went abroad thanks to a government scholarship. If I, if I had been born in the hills of Chihuahua, of, of Oaxaca, I would not have even the smallest chance of being where I am today. So one of the things that the president has made a very serious commitment is that he has to guarantee to all Mexicans the same level of opportunities, the same quality of governance, and the same level of security. Today, we're facing tremendous challenges in the state of Guerrero, partially in the state of Michoacán, two of 32 entities. But the ones of you that have investments in Querétaro, in Aguascalientes, in, 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 in San Luis, you are yourself witnesses that those states are within the better or highest standards of wherever else in the world you are comparing them to. But as Mexicans, we cannot afford to have this split story. And, and in, on education, what we are doing is we are working very closely with the industry in order to really improve uh, the supply of uh, technically uh, trained labor that can be that can keep being do, uh, that can, can be, uh, be a very good source of supply for the future. One of the success stories is that today, so far with the developments that we had, most of the industries have been very happy the quality, with the quality of labor. And they send them to be trained in Germany or send them to be trained in the US. And, and sometimes they use them to help them in other plants in the world. But you are right, if we do not work hand by hand with uh, the Minister of Education, the intermediate level of technicians, and the industry, in order to keep growing the supply of labor force, if we don't, if we don't care that, for that, then at some point in the next five years, 
we're going to have a shortage of uh, good quality labor force. So far today, I think things have been developing properly. And many of the governors, very smartly, are immersed in uh, intermediate education. And they are doing programs with their own industry, trying to really make sure that the supply of labor is there at the technical level, at the engineering level, and at the executive level. And I think that uh, we are extremely aware that that will be a key for success for the coming years. Okay, thank you. What I'm going to do now, uh, because uh, uh, the Secretary has agreed to stay till the end of the session, I think it will be good to bring in the other, the other speakers to get the view also from the car maker and the supplier, and then we can continue with the questions uh, after, the, after the next presentation. So, I, I can assure so, you that the credibility of, of them is higher than mine. No, no. <laughs> they are doing business. I'm just trying to design policy. Yeah. So, uh, so next up, to, uh, and to welcome to the podium, I'd like to welcome Gabriel Lopez, the president and CEO of Ford Mexico. Thank you. Bueno, así como el secretario les hizo levantar la mano a los bilingües, ahora los voy a hacer. So, to, uh, show, uh, to raise your hand to know who are bilinguals, uh, people in the audience, now I'll uh, put your brain to work and uh, I'll change language. Uh, time is short. This is the agenda. I'll share with you the size of the automotive industry and what is the scale. What volume are we talking about? And of course, what is the size in particular for Ford and the logistics necessary imposed by Ford, uh, uh, imposed on Mexico and the plans into the future on the part of Ford. As you can see here on the slide, we have had significant changes in relative competitiveness of the different regions of the world. As we can see on the slide, Brazil and Australia have basically lost the competitiveness significantly. Mexico and the US, in a way, have maintained the relative competitiveness they used to have in the past. And uh, we are also see some regions like Europe, which have lost uh, competitiveness, not at the same rate as Australia and Brazil, but they have been lagging behind in regards to those being the leaders in competitiveness in the automotive industry. That is Mexico, USA, India, and Thailand. Later on, you will see how the automotive industry is focused there. Competitiveness is key to maintain a profitable business into the future. Here we have some other pieces of information. Which ones are under pressure? Those economies that have not been opened to the world. We see Brazil, Russia, China. Even China has had a dramatic cost increase in recent times, which has to do with labor the pressure on logistics, and it also has to do with several infrastructure issues they face. Uh, yes, China has been working on this, but not at the same speed as demand and uh, supply grow. When we see who are the rising stars, what we are talking about in the end, we're talking about Mexico and the US. The US, clearly, after the main crisis and the fixed cost adjustment, sets it in a different competitiveness condition in comparison to the past. For the US, the exchange rate and monetary fluctuations will be important to see if the competitiveness is maintained in the future. Mexico, because of the enormous effort as described by Mr. Secretary in terms of infrastructure and attracting investment, and also with the, the through investment, the global competitiveness of the country goes up. When we compare the main countries in terms of automotive production, we see the ones growing faster. Mexico ranks three in terms of growth in the industry. Then we also have China, which grew in 2014 more than 200 percent. The industry is growing very fast, and the production capacity has to go hand in hand. 
Thailand, of course, India, of course, and Mexico, of course, have grown. This is the consequence of what we saw in terms of competitiveness in the previous slides. When we see into the future on the next slide, we realize how the prognosis that we have on the part of DHS based on investment announcements made and based on investment forecast of automotive industry all over the world, we see how the same countries maintain basically the same relative position, the same ranking. We believe in 2020 Mexico will be growing in the same uh, at the same rate in terms of production as it is growing now, arriving at almost 5 million units, as mentioned during the previous presentation by Mr. Secretary. Of course, these figures will continue to evolve as the announcements are made, but I would say there are uh, many possibilities for Mexico, Mexican automotive industry to exceed the 5 million units in 2020, given the competitive advantages in comparison with other economies in the region and in the global context. Where the Mexican government has worked and continues to work. Now, when we see the importance for Ford Mexico, we see that we, and I always say it in-house, we have discovered Mexico. Many years ago, Ford Motor Company has presence in Mexico. In fact, this year we're celebrating 90 years uh, physical presence, but certainly we sell cars here uh, for more than 100 years. Mexico is the fourth country in terms of automotive pro produ production for Ford and is the Ford engine production, as you can see on the screen, higher than Canada and Brazil, Spain in terms of car assembly and engines uh, exceeding the number of many large economies certainly over behind England, the US and China. Now in logistic terms because logistics is as important to us because not only do we manufacture cars and engines, but also we acquire many inputs, not only from Mexico and North America, but also from the rest of the world. As you can see, Mexico is the second world supplier for inputs for Ford. Certainly, China will grow at an important rate in the coming years as auto parts industry is developed in this country and as we develop with more co products. But you can see on the chart, Mexico is in second position behind the U.S. 13.9%, 14% of global acquisitions represent $2 billion of inputs that Mexico acquires to, for, from Mexican vendors. Certainly, several of these 12 billion have components from other countries and in the bar graph to the right this is the forecast growth for the year 2017 20 percent of combined growth of the vendors industry in Mexico and this is not related to the investments of automotive industry in Mexico but also from global vendors of parts to meet the challenge of these new demands. For Ford Mexico, uh, we don't need a supplier with cheap input. We are interested in having an engineering center in Mexico and this, as you can see, in the past seven years we have grown the Center of Engineering in Mexico and today we have 8% of the headcount from engineering of North America. North America supplies 30% of engineering services for Fourth Corporation worldwide. So Mexico's participation is important in engineering service provision 
capacity, the technical capability, technical training of Mexican staff availability, it's impressive in order to be able to provide this type of services. I'm not talking about uh, sketchers or basic engineering works, but we do have some highly specific areas in the center of engineering design for complex system with a sophistication level that it's high and will continue to be higher into the future and our forecast is to grow the participation of Mexico's engineering for Ford. We had discovered a stone that will be polished all the way to be a diamond. Certainly this comes with saving costs, localizing this workforce, but the quality level of deliverables from the engineering departments in the year 2014 has been better than quality from the American and German Center of Design. Now, talking about logistics, our, as you can see, our logistics system is rather complex. The size of our operation is complex. This is not only to manufacture vehicles or engines. We must take them to local or foreign plants in Europe, Asia, North America, and take these manufacturing materials, which is not exclusive for North America, but to other regions of the world as well. So from suppliers, we have all the elements in this chain to be able to control it. We use trucks, ships, rail, railroad, railways massively. We fly material as well uh, to a lesser degree, certainly, but we continue to design our network to assure the lowest cost possible and the higher speed of goods in trade. We have the highest speed of turnover in Mexico. We require consolidation in order to make sure that the goods arrive in time. And as you can see, we ship regions from all the world. Now, when we talk about vendors, where are they? As you can see, they are located from the center to the north. And this has to do with a comment from the Secretary of en Economy and the effort that the government is conducted to develop the south of Mexico. Aligned with this, and you can see the location of our plants in these maps, vendors have located in hubs closer to consumption centers, some of them in the state of Mexico, in the Bahia region, and in the northern region of Mexico. When we see this with the inbound perspective, as I said, as I said, many of the materials and vehicles and engines that we produce have imported components. Uh, I was relating to the comment from the Secretary of Economy, as Adam Smith said, trade is one of the web is is part of the wealth of a country. So we do not only export, but we also import. We have presence in five ports. We have customs representation in many locations of our city and see the size of our operation. We have close to 100 flights per month. 46% of our activities are done through rail cars rail card which are truly effective and it is an economic and relatively fast means we have trade through truck shipments but only short distances from plant to plant from industrial parks to plants almost 8,000 activities by month between Hermosillo Sonora long distances traffic is through rail car and certainly almost 650 overseas shipment 
that have to do with export and imports of vehicles and materials and see the customs operations conducted daily. This is why it is so critical to have an aligned order between the industry customs so goods can be traded easily and certainly outbound. It is critical as well, but I would say that it's rather simpler. The traffic of vehicles is through rail car going to the US. This simplifies our operation. We load the cars in our plants, uh, in our facilities, and they are shipped to the US or to the port of Veracruz from any of our three locations. Certainly, we have uh, a certain amount of cars dropping. We try to avoid congestion of roads. This is an issue for the automotive industry. That's why we try to uh, avoid truck shipments. And certainly we import and export cars worldwide. These are wonderful vehicles that I invite you to buy one of them. Certainly the local logistic design is what we call a spider web. We do not only have several distribution centers in Mexico where vehicles arrive and then are distributed and shipped to different dealers in, in Mexico. One of them is located in Veracruz, Cuautitlán, Guadalajara, Hermosillo, Monterrey, located near the gravity center of the region. We have rail car movements between these distribution centers for vehicles that arrive and vehicles that are ready to be shipped. And somehow these distribution centers are located in the geographical centers of these regions of our country. This illustration is regarding imports. As I said, we import cars from faraway places as India, where we import the smallest cars and we have a sea pathway that crosses Japan and then arrives to the Pacific. Then we have the South American path that takes cars from Cuautitlan and Hermosillo and we have cars coming from Europe and from the US. This is a rather complex system that requires of a uh, well-oiled logistics to make sure that cars arrive in time and when the customer needs them. And exports are through border posts in North America. The vast majority of our plants production is for the US or Canada. But then certainly we have air exports uh, departing from the Port of Veracruz toward different destinations. And this is the path between the US and South America. We have these. We have two, one from the Atlantic and another one from the Pacific. And we hope these will grow through the free trade agreement from for the uh, Alianza Pacifico, we will add Peru very shortly, and vehicles for Bolivia will arrive through Peru. This is done from Veracruz or from Jacksonville and Baltimore in the U.S. In fact, cars manufactured in Mexico that we sell in the west coast of the U.S., they are sh they go through overseas ship and it is a lot cheaper than by rail car. The west coast from the distribution center of Nogales also is through rail car. This is the distribution of our production. Today we manufacture three lines of cars, Fiesta and Cuautitlan in the northern part of Mexico City, 65% goes to North America, but South America receives an important part, almost 25%, and the remaining stays in Mexico. Larger cars, mostly they go to the US from the Lincoln MK seat. We sell to China, Korea, and Thailand. This car is 
manufactured in our Hermosillo plant and is distributed in 50 countries of the world that, uh, in order to simplify uh, this chart, are, is not showing this figure. Now, when we see how can we develop an issue that we have worked with the Mexican government since 25 years ago, and it is how to expedite border crossing. With the recently recent initiatives, uh, we have been the first company to be certified, and this assures that our material crosses the border without the need to inspect documents, without the need of opening the trucks or open rail car wagons. This is a significant reduction, not only in terms of time, but also of inventory. And this is where the key lies in order to reduce transportation time. Certainly, we must work in the infrastructure, railway and roads infrastructure, but these border crossings are key to make sure the goods arrive in time. Through time, we have worked with different tools and we have influence over these tools to make sure that they are dynamic, that have the proper controls, but should be dynamic in order to increase the speed of this traffic. So they have been helpful, particularly these NEC. Since day one, we work hand in hand with the government, and we have been the first one to certify to be make sure that our goods cross faster. Certainly, port efforts are a muscle, so to make sure that our ships depart on time. And to conclude, as mentioned by the Secretary of Economy, said almost 30 percent of Mexican exports are from the automotive industry. That's why it is so critical, as I said, a whale oil logistics in infrastructure investment work between industry and government to work on the tools and in the bureaucratic and administrative processes in order to simplify and impart dynamism in the trade of goods. This sector has an income of approximately 80 billion dollars and still growing as you saw when the Mexican industry reaches 5 million units this figure will double the automotive industry il employs almost 700,000 employees and this is a fast growing sector and soon will reach 5 million units for the year 2020. When we look into the future, competitiveness has a lot to do with the logistics capability because materials have the same cost uh, for everyone. Steel, aluminum, plastic have the same price for everyone, so logistics will make the competitive difference. The supplier's base will increase even faster than the automotive industry, though there will be a need of trading goods between vendors and vendors to plants and from vendors to exports and imports. So by consequence, this volume will have a significant growth. Certainly, our logistics network, which is complex and sophisticated, but we must work on continuous improvement. And the capability to improve our logistics will determine the location of plants. So, Mr. Secretary, if your interest is to develop the South Region uh, logistic network position in the southern part of Mexico will be a good trigger for investment there. And certainly, we need stability in our systems. That is why we must continue working in expediting these systems. So thank you so much. Thank you for your attention. And I am up for any question. Muchas gracias. A perspective from a car maker. 
Uh, obviously, just you know, we are we are overrunning this session time-wise, but I think there's such uh, good presentations and for some of the most important people in the industry. So I'm going to you know we'll, we'll, we'll let it flow a little bit longer and we'll include some more question times at the end. Um, so next up, now we will hear from the supplier side, the tier supplier side, very importantly. So I'd like to welcome uh, to the podium Hector Gutierrez, the president of Delphi Mexico. Thank you. Buenos días a todos. I was listening to Gabriel's message and certainly you must have a, a Ford car, Fusions, Lincoln, Mustangs manufactured in Hermosillo. I will present, I represent Delphi and I will present our history and the challenges ahead with the time we had had a presence in Mexico. We have a 30 years history of Delphi in Mexico. We have many success stories in Mexico and many challenges as well. Uh, something important, a company as ours that provides of components to car assemblies does not compete in a country. It's a global competition. We are located in Mexico, but our competition is global. This is a 37 year of history in Mexico. We have 46 plants. We have presence in 22 cities in Mexico, across 12 states of the northern part of our country. We have 61,000 employees in Mexico. And certainly our approach is towards the automotive production. We produce more than 13 million parts per day. We process 88 million pieces from 2,000 suppliers by day. We ship close to 20 million parts every workday to 8,000 locations from diverse customers and we have a 99.5 on time delivery and in quality we have less than two parts rejected per million what's it, it's important when we started in 1977 we began with electrical wires for cars these were about 20 wires and five components and now the number uh, the amount quantity of wires in Mexico by year it's equal to se close to 7 million kilometers of wire this represents nine times from the earth to the moon per year and this has to do with logistics when you move such quantity of components when you ship such amounts of final products logistics comes to be one of the most important elements in the foundation of success for a company as Delphi we have an engineering center which is one of the largest that we have in the world in 1995 we broke the paradigm to be only an assembly company. We began designing, testing components and products globally used in our company for our customers. We have more than 1,000 records for invention and more than 300 patents. This makes us really proud because most of these patents and invention records are by Mexican inge engineers. We are located in Ciudad Juarez, Chihuahua. We are focused in three mega trends, which are safe, connected, and environment. These are the ruler ruling axis for our designs for our customers. This is a model to develop capabilities in this design center. And we must consider and design according to innovation trends that are requested by our customers. Here you can see some examples with all the smartphones. Since their creation, they revolutionize our industry in many cases, and one of them is to change design and connectivity with 
the car. This is an example, this is a video of three minutes which is focused on safety, another element from auto manufacturers, they are focused in improving safety of their cars and just for your information there is close to 150 million accidents related to a vehicle. Hello everyone, welcome to my family's version of the much-loved classic, School Drop-Off. Please meet my sister, your typical overachiever with a heart of gold. This is my brother, fully equipped with standard older brother features. And dad, one of the best on the road. And me, your trusted narrator. On with the show. Thanks to the engineering team at Delphi, passionate about making a difference and dedicated to intelligent innovations that matter, I don't have to be a backseat driver. But I do spy a car backing out of its driveway a little too quickly for my taste. Thankfully, our radar and vision fusion system has detected the closing distance and speed between cars. And Delphi's 360 degree sensing provides a full scan of the road ahead and around our car. The data, along with the GPS and navigation technology, alerts Dad to the fact that he's going to need to stop and avoid an uncomfortable conversation with our neighbor. <laughs> Can you get enough of how effective this technology is? Though Dad always keeps his eyes on the road, why not have the car co-pilot a while? Because distractions can fly in from anywhere. With the automated driving system engaged, Dad is able to settle him down. Good thing, because I see traffic slowing down. Delphi's radar and vision fusion system has picked up the closing distance and speed between the cars. A 360 degree scan of the road, with the GPS and navigation technology, provides road conditions, determining that it is safe for us to change lanes, avoiding the slowed traffic. This time, our car completes the maneuver on its own. One day he'll realize that this is far more interesting than that. There are times when Dad distracts himself, like every time he tries to figure out who this week's love of our life is. Yoo-hoo, driver. Seems we are veering a tad. However, in the trusted hands of Delphi's award-winning radar and vision technologies, our car sticks the drop-off landing. I so look forward to the dropping off part of drop-off. I get to marvel at Delphi's unique extensive portfolio of automated driving capabilities. Complex, yes, but delivering simple and important driving improvements. And I get to experience today how driving will be for me when these flywheels are mine. And above all, drop-off means I finally get to be more than a backseat driver. These technologies available in many parts of the world, many cars already bring it integrated. It's surprising, 10 years ago, this was just an idea for the future. And now we see cars with great development in order to prevent accidents. And this is a positive picture of Mexico that the Ministry of Economy explained thoroughly and is related to the number of investments and what the government is announcing as impact of its measures. I think it's important that this type of messages and images will continue to sustain and support in the world. Also, uh, different announces from Mexico that certainly will change Mexico's image abroad, aside from increasing productivity with these projects. I think that one of the things that we see in any company 
we see an objective and we see it in a straight line although reality is that oftentimes this line is not straight there are challenges and obstacles and we must surpass them as many companies and governments struggle to overcome these objects and we try to manage and keep this straight line as straight as possible so success will not reach only companies but also our country something important as well regarding global competitiveness report if we see the top 10 we see countries that somehow have developed many of their infrastructure and the approach they have had led them to be in these 10 positions. I think this is a great opportunity for Mexico. Mexico is in the 61st position out of 144. Certainly it is a great challenge for us as country and as companies. And yes, certainly we want to be in this top 10 list in competitiveness. Talking about roads in Mexico, we have 133,000 kilometers uh, of roads in Mexico. This is important for logistics. What is important is that this 10% of these roads are four-lane roads, and this is what logistics suppliers use and the challenge I think lies in how we continue to build in this network how to take it when there is not uh, available at, at, at an affordable cost for logistics providers talking about logistics performance index score if you can see these graphic how we are according to the World Bank how we are ranked when the objective lies in this five we are above 3.2 but certainly all of these countries have made important breakthrough to hope be in these positions we continue to work to move and reach this five score that will benefit our logistics suppliers from companies. This is a breakdown of parameters. You can see here how we are doing. We are ranking number 50 out of 160 countries. And here we have each one of them, how we are categorized by the elements that they measure for this ranking. Even with all the changes that we have had, we see there is room for improvement in some of the areas. So here it is key to have 100% trust in our cargo suppliers. We need to be able to ship day in, day out. We don't have high inventory levels. We have to have shipments every day in a consistent manner. So we need infrastructure and we need reliable suppliers. Also, we were talking about the topic of certifications to improve crossing times at the crossing points and uh, this has been very helpful in the past we had a truck it took longer to cross uh, we're talking now about minutes or in some instances hours to cross uh, the border now we're trying to improve uh, via certifications another important challenge for us when you have 60,000 employees of course you want to gather the best workforce the best graduates from schools with technical capabilities and administration uh, knowledge to do the job. We are talking here about the education system that we have in place. Certainly, this has to 
go through the changes announced. If you see this information out of uh, every 100 children starting school in Mexico, 10 finish university and only three are able to have uh, graduate studies degrees. We believe there is uh, opportunity in terms of uh, education in Mexico. Mexico is one of the countries investing more on education, but unfortunately we cannot feel the results in terms of the people coming out from schools. We know we need to have the right people with the right set of skills through the right training and education so that they can do their role. The issue here is for all the companies that are suppliers, do they have the right people as we look for them? But we cannot leave everything in the hands of one single entity or the government. We have to do our work. We have to do our part. We are working on a pilot program in Juarez City with a regional council for development of education. The idea is to connect industry with universities so that the curricula develop the skills in the labor we need rather than coming out of school without having a job or rather than having ha companies having to bring people from other places to do the job in the plant. We are getting good results. We have an association with 10 manufacturing companies in the city. Five main universities are participating. All of them are connected and we keep on working. If this works well, we will continue to replicate this uh, scheme elsewhere in the country. Delphi buys 18% of direct materials from Mexico and 96% of indirect materials. Direct materials for us is basic and we need to keep on uh, finding suppliers. Suppliers need to have the motivation and incentives for them to establish their plants and we need more people, more companies to be part of this. In summary, in closing, we need logistics and infrastructure projects need to become a reality. We need to keep on working on the education system to overhaul it and need, we need to establish quality suppliers close to the plants, to the industry. That's it, my presentation. Thank you for your time. I hope you had a clear picture of Mexico and how it is facing challenges. Thank you. Mil gracias. So we've had some uh, very interesting presentations from the government, from the uh, Ministry of the Economy, from a, a major global car maker and a major global supplier. As I said, we've obviously overrun, but I do want to take just maybe two questions or three questions, if we can keep the actual questions short as well. And of course, they can be in, in English or Spanish. So I don't know if at the back there, please, first. Okay, mi nombre es Juan Antonio de Hoyos, yo represento a TCM Grupo en Saltillo, Coahuila. Este, primero agradezco la, la invitación, yo creo que ha sido unos exponentes muy, muy importantes. Y para el señor secretario tengo una pregunta. Yo creo que estamos hablando mucho de infraestructura, ahorita ya se está congestionando mucho. congestion in Nuevo Laredo. From north to south, the highway. Is there any investment, any plan for that part? I think we need to standardize and have wider highways. Just as general information, the airport, Laredo Airport, is the only one with the Mexican uh, customs and Mexican and U.S. customs on the U.S. side. It is worthwhile to let you know that you can make use of that airport for that region to expedite uh, the paperwork. 
está activado. Sí. El, el aeropuerto que hace referencia es el aeropuerto de la The Argentina. airport is that on the Mexican side or on the US side? Yes, we're talking about Laredo, Texas, US side airport. At this step, at this time, uh, I can give you good news. It's very likely for the executive of Mexico, executive power, to prepare a proposal for the legislative power. So there is a consideration of two or three pilot programs for custom for clearance in Mexico. Historically, we have tried. There is a pilot program in Fosco, in Chihuahua, and also in another location in Cabos, Baja Airport, where we are able to have the model between uh, custom officials from uh, the, the U.S. can they dispatches, so it is clear the, the merchandise from the point of origin to go through customs to the other country. The problem is that um, officers from another country cannot uh, carry weapons in the Mexican side. That's according to the law. There was an analysis made and this has to be also discussed with the legislative power because that would have a great impact positively in the cost to have clearance from the point of origin at the airport and uh, on the border. The, of course, we would start with pilot programs. Another thing about infrastructure, what President Peña did with President Obama in the high-level economic group headed by uh, vice, the vice president of the U.S. and the Secretary of the Treasury of Mexico, I am a technical secretary uh, for that uh, group. And uh, we had uh, this uh, work on specific objectives for customs, for border issues and regulatory convergence in terms of planning and infrastructure for border communication. What we are doing is to define objectives. This year, we already completed the railroad Tornillo crossing. It will be open in the weeks to come. We also concluded and worked on another crossing strategically planned to open simultaneously elsewhere on the border. And we are working with all the facilitation terms for the reliable traveler, reliable trade and other programs so as to have a security at the crossing points. The topic of uh, the overcrowded Monterrey Laredo Highway basically at the crossing point which is the most important part also is going through some other crossing points in different parts of the border and uh, this is part of the strengthening the infrastructure i do not have any information about the future plans for that highway segment the logical thing would be to open alternatives for crossing points so that uh, this there is a faster process to go through among the good news for logistics after 20 years of struggling for the U.S. to acknowledge the opening for transportation service. Finally, the tra Department of Transportation of the U.S. opened the registration for Mexican companies so that uh, regarding ground transportation they do not have to change the trailer, uh, the containers, because Mexican uh, companies outside of the pilot program could not go into the U.S. Finally, we achieved that. This was already uh, approved. It was effectively appro uh, seen in the pilot program and the registration is starting so there is logistics from end to end without having to switch after crossing. We can be in touch, but uh, I can provide you information regarding the northbound highway to uh, Laredo and also any other information regarding expediting crossing points. I don't think we really have Gracias. time for for any more questions, but I think that the information that the, that the three great speakers provided in this session has been excellent and I hope uh, a great start to the conference. So I'd really like to thank the, uh, the opening speakers, uh, Ildefonso Guajardo, the Secretary of the Economy for the Mexican Government, Gabriel Lopez, Presidency of Food Mexico, and Hector Gutierrez, the president of Delphi, Mexico. Thank you very much for giving us a great start. Thank you.
So please join us for the coffee and we will be starting at 10 past uh, for, for the next sessions. So please be back in time for, uh, for the start. Thank you.